got to Kansas, says my father was a Buffalo soldier, and the 9th and 10th Cavalry was stationed at uh, Fort Huachuca, and then they came here, Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and then they were transferred up here in the uh, in the 30s, and he, they had the horseshoe. My father was in the horseshoe, I mean in the in the horse cavalry, and the major horseshoe training facility uh, for the cavalry was at Fort. Fort Raleigh. So my dad used to have to come up and, and get his training, and he eventually became a trainer. He was considered one of the best horseshoers in the, in, in, in the whole cavalry, okay? And so uh, he finally got transferred up here, and then we moved, we moved here in 1938. Well, it was kind of like any military brat. My, they were constantly moving my father around. And I would go from one town to the next, from one elementary school to the next. By the time they got through bouncing me around, I couldn't spell my name, let alone uh, understand what they meant by phonics. So they finally, after going to California and kind of living with whoever would keep me, I used to roam up and down Central Avenue, uh, which was the black side of Los Angeles. And, of course, the people you emulated then were the street hustlers. So what you saw were pimps, prostitutes, gamblers, hustlers, you name it. And those were the only places we could go. And I used to be a shoe shine boy. I shined shoes on the corner of 12th and Central Avenue in Los Angeles, California. And I would often get to see such people as Henry Armstrong, the great welterweight fighter, Jack Johnson who was at one time the heavyweight champion of the world. And on that side, I got to see Kenny Washington, who was a great football player at the University of Cal uh, um, uh, UCLA, and uh, Jackie Robinson and all those guys. I was just a kid when they, were, when they were getting ready to go through school. So they influenced me. Although I was in a uh, horrible, immediate environment, we had the ambition to go to the Coliseum and watch Jackie Robinson and Kenny Washington and all those guys and one day visualize ourselves being there. So I, I got a desire to go to college not to get an education but to play football because that was my ambition and I got to see Kenny Washington do it. I got to see Jackie Robinson and Woody Stroh and those guys. So that, that, that was kind of the, the influence. I used to go out to the Coliseum at UCLA, at the USC, and watch them play. And then they would, the other part was they would come over to the playground. Kenny Washington, Jackie Robinson would come over to the 38th Street Playground in LA and, and teach us. And that's when I began to uh, learn that these uh, just a moment, just a fleeting moment of personal attention from a person like that could give you the seeds coupled with your mother and father drumming it in your head, get an education. These guys validated getting an education. So that, 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 kind of, that seed kind of planted. And it was never a time that I can remember that I didn't intend to go to college. Well... When I came up, you know, segregation was still the name of the game, and um, the effect of bleeding Kansas hadn't worked off yet. But interestingly enough, Junction City was one of the most desegregated, I won't say integrated, but one of the most desegregated communities in the state of Kansas because of all the troops that were there. The 9th Cavalry, the 10th Cavalry, and, 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 and other black troops. So there was a level of openness that existed in Junction City and in and around Fort Raleigh and Manhattan that didn't necessarily exist anywhere else in, in the state. So, but, but the other part was there was no social environment for kids who were in high school. We'd have to go down on 9th Street, which was uh, a gambler's den, to be candid, frank, about eight or nine places that you gambled. <laughs> all day and all night and those were our only places for recreation so I kind of came up uh, with with a, a kind of a mixed agenda going wanted to go to college wanted to play football but also wanted to understand the hustler's life and the gambler's life and it was kind of interesting people will look at me from Junction now uh, particularly when I went to Washburn and then went on to go other they'd look and say you know we used to see him down here on the crap tables every night I can't believe he's going to college 
<laughs> what, what's he going to be doing going to college? They got to be kidding. That guy's got a hustler. He's, that's what he's going to be. But uh, that, was, that wasn't the driving force. But I, I learned that life. And when I say I learned that life, I learned the negatives. And if you want to call it a positive, I learned, I'll say the negatives and the pluses. And the pluses never appealed to me because you constantly were looking over your shoulders to see if you're going to get arrested. And if you weren't going to get arrested, then to see if a guy who watched you win big on the crap table wasn't laying around the corner waiting to rob you. So that, that, that life never took hold, all right? And as a result of that, I was able to constantly focus on, uh, on going to school, how long we're done, on the crap cables at night. I get them to go to school the next day. That's what baffled folks. I'd be at school and I'd have my homework done. <laughs> and I was in good shape. I could run. I could run 100, 220 in the quarter. I could do it all. So it was kind of strange, but no one down on 9th Street, that hustler's dive area, no one down there thought I was going to go to college. And they thought it was the greatest joke in the world when I went. And, and finished, they couldn't believe it. But uh, that, that, that was the drive that, that made it possible. And I think there are kids that are doing the same thing today, but the difference is they don't have anyone in that milieu who gets out, gets away from it, or keeps it at a distance so that it doesn't dominate them and, uh, and control their hopes and, and, and aspirations. Uh, they had this crazy policy in Junction City High School that I don't understand today, but all seniors, black seniors, their picture went in the back of the yearbook. Uh, you went to school with them all the way through, but when it's time to graduate, your picture was in the back of the yearbook. So I started my civil rights uh, struggle by convincing the 13 blacks who were going to graduate from Junction in 1943, we won't put our picture in the yearbook, period. So we, we wouldn't put our picture in the yearbook. Now, what was, the pressure was on me because that same year, I made All-State as a football player. I was the first black in the state of Kansas to be named an All-State football player. So they came to me with a bribe, and they said, if you put your picture in, we'll give you the, the center spread. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd have a big picture of you on one page, and then you in your football uniform, your basketball uniform, uh, and, and your track uniform, and we'll tell a real story about it. I said, no, nah, uh, I'm not doing that. If you go to Junction City today and ask them to let you see the 43 yearbook, you won't find any blacks in the senior class. You will not find them there. What happened, that's when I began to realize that if you put the pressure on pe decent people will for one of another term, we'll do the right thing. They won't, I won't say they'll crack, but they'll do the right thing. The very next year, I was in, I went on, uh, was in the Third Army with Patton in World War II. But when I came back, I'll never forget walking up the street, Main Street in Junction, and uh, the principal honked his horn and jumped out of the car and ran over and threw both hands, arms around me and hugged me. I'd been hit, I was wounded, and everybody knew that I was a disabled vet. So he said, get in the car. I said, okay, where are we going? He said, just get in. I got in the car, he wheeled around, went down to the high school, jumped out of the car. He was almost running. And I'm limping along behind him. When he got into the, his office, he snatched the 44 year book off, the, off, the, off of the shelf, opened it up and said, look at this. So everybody was in there in, 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 an, in their alphabetical order. So I realized then that if you do it with, in a sophisticated fashion, you bring the pressure to bear in a sophisticated fashion, this is one country where when the pressure is off, they'll finally do the right thing. So that, that got me into the protest movement, and it, I, <laughs> I haven't stopped yet. I got hit March the 21st. I got hit in the chest, and, and a bullet came out of, uh, of my hip. And of course, one of the things we learned then is the little kids that we gave chocolate and cigarettes and all those good things, we had to run the gauntlet. They were, the Germans said, if we can kill off their supply line, the troops are way out there. If we can kill off the supply line, then we got them. Well, the Red Ball Express object was to get the supplies up there, shells, food, whatever they needed. Little kids you'd give candy and, and, and cigarettes and whatever in the daytime. At night, those kids were pulling the mines up on the road. 
<laughs> so the little kid, you know, and it was very nice, great big smile on their face. After the sun went down, you see you're in a truck, you can't turn your lights on. And you're running the gauntlet. So you're, a truck is leaving every five minutes, sometimes a little longer than that, so that if one got hit, it wouldn't stack them all up. And, and if you try to go off the highway and go around, you have run into minefields. So you had to stay on, and if you stayed on, you couldn't see the mine, you'd run out and blow your truck up. Uh, we, we, we had no idea that was what was going on. But on March the 21st, I took a small arm fire in the chest and came out. And you see, you couldn't have your lights on. You had to have your mirror up, your windshield up, so because it would throw off some kind of reflection. So I came back. I got four operations over there. And the fifth one at Fitzsimmons, they patched up the muscle on my hip. And uh, I ended up... Uh, uh, taking full advantage of the GI Bill of Rights, which I consider the only colorblind piece of legislation ever passed by the Congress. And that enabled me to go, I knew I could go to college then. And uh, uh, I went to Indiana University first, made the ball club, couldn't find a place to live. And in the meantime, a former high school coach was here in Topeka. And he called me from Indiana and said, you're not going to like it there. Why don't you come on back here? So I came back, and um, he, they had arranged. I had a wife and two children then, and my uh, wife was pregnant with another child. So when I came back, um, they found a place for me to live here, and I enrolled in Washburn. And going to Washburn was the greatest decision I ever made. Greatest decision I ever made. Well, coming from a, a, a military family, um, um, my dad was totally dedicated, and so was so was so was my mother. And in my case, we had hopes that uh, although my dad had fought in World War One and nothing changed, for reasons that I can't really put my finger on, we in my generation had hopes and believed that it would change. And so. Uh, in spite of the fact that that the, the there was no good blood, I don't I don't know what our thinking process was, but in spite of the fact that the the, the camaraderie just didn't exist, there was some camaraderie when we went into battle, or when we were up near uh, up near the line where we were bringing in supplies, materials, and equipment. There was some camaraderie there, but the very minute they came off the line, um, the division the was there. And we were fighting a war, and the generals didn't have time um, to get into some kind of social adjustment thing. They had, to, had a war to win. Yeah, uh, Baltimore, of course, Baltimore was segregated. Remember now, Baltimore was segregated by statute. The state of Nebraska was segregated by statute. Man. Yep. So there was no hotel I could go to, no restaurant I could go to. <laughs> no. <laughs> So it was strange for me to be there. But they were in trouble and needed help, and I could catch and run. So you have an attitude among athletes. You know, we will work together, play, practice together, and play together, and hopefully win together. But when the game is over, he goes his way and I go mine. And so it, it, the, the, the race thing in terms of camaraderie never became an issue. The issue was, does he have the skills to help us be a winner? And if you have the skills to help us be a winner, uh, that's it. So I, I didn't expect anything but an opportunity to play and, and do my best to play well. Once you got through taking your shower or whatever it is, you put your clothes on, walked out the door, you went one way and they went the other. And, and, and that, that's kind of the way it was. Uh, Art Donovan, who was one of the tackles, uh, Art and I um, got along uh, pretty good. Y.E. Tittle was the quarterback. And why and I cause got along because I was his receiver. But though it was a personal relationship thing, not necessarily one that encompassed the whole team. Uh, it's, it, it's difficult to, to describe, but during that first wave of blacks into the professional athletic field, whether it's baseball or football, it was more tolerance than accept. I tolerate him because he has a skill we need to be a winner. So in environments and situations where I have to tolerate him, you know, I tolerate him. 
if if once that's over then if we have enough of a relationship to go into a camaraderie relationship after the game and go places together then so be it but it's all about his ability to contribute to this team and that that's it and that's not the case today at all. That's what's been interesting is to watch the, the transition from mere tolerance to camaraderie. These guys are friends now. They, they pull for each other. They play. It's, 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 it's a great thing to see. But that's what it was when we first broke in. Well, I'll personalize it again and say that it's the household I came out of. Okay, my father, military background, mother very consistent with it. That's a part of it. The other part of it is the knowledge, the knowledge, even then, the knowledge then that one day where we are today would be a reality in my lifetime, okay? And I came out of a culture that said, you know, after you give up, then what? Let me say that again. After you give up, then what? So what use is giving up? You might as well keep on trying. And that's the kind of that's, a, that's the kind of environment that I came out of, and <clears throat> the same the same is true. I don't I <coughs> forgot to mention that there were 13 blacks in the Junction City High School that I graduated from, in, <coughs> in 43. You know, the 12 of them finished college. 12 of them finished college. Now we're talking about the first half of this century. They finished college, and my point is, you came out there in Junction City in the Fort Raleigh area. You came out of a culture that said you can't give up even if you want to, okay? And, and it, it was that, and then that, that constant feeling of, uh, we call it benchmarking today, but that constant uh, uh, kind of benchmarking what the difference, and your parents made you look at it, what the difference between your opportunity and theirs. And my dad, you know, my dad drove home, just like, uh, just like uh, Scott. Uh, the lawyer that made sure I went to school. My dad drove home the fact that he only had a third grade education and that, particularly when the war started, he said, if I had a high school diploma, son, I'd be an officer. The fact that I only have a third grade education is keeping me from doing what I would have a chance to do. When they look at my file and see that uh, that's all the education I am, a great soldier, can really put shoes on a horse, uh, I'm so good at it, the horse lifts up their feet so I can do it, but uh, I'm limited. I, I can't go to OCS if I wanted to, but uh, if I had the education, then I could do it. Uh, that's what we kept hearing, and when you come out of that environment, it, 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 you know, it, it becomes a seed, and in the right environment, it grows. It takes control, and that's, that's what happened. The assumption was that if the federal government spends money, that somehow those federal tax dollars that are paid by everybody will employ everybody. The Warden School of Business said, let's take a look. So they did 27 studies on America's basic industry to show what the employment policies, practices, and procedures were. And it turned out that that wasn't the case at all. That wasn't the case at all. Now, when I went over to the White House to talk to Nixon, I, instead of going over with a good, strong argument, I simply went over with a synopsis of what those 27 studies said. And I had a book with me, in fact, I got it over there now, called Manpower Needs and Goals for the Decade of the 70s. Well, Manpower Needs and Goals for the Decade of the 70s said that the different industries that were going to grow in huge percentages and behind that, it said, we will have to recruit from overseas <laughs> because, because if we put that much money in the market, it's going to drive up inflation because there won't be enough growth in the labor market or in the workforce to keep that from happening. I took those studies in that book over to the White House and sat down with, with Nixon staff people and walked them through the findings of those studies. From Warren's, They asked, where's your data? Or who, who, what's your authority? I said, how about Warren School of Business? <laughs> they said, what? I think that's the number one or number two business school in the country. And yeah, okay, here's what they say that our industries uh, don't do 
after they get the federal contract. And here's the reason we're allowing 800,000 people a year to come into the country, because we haven't trained, we haven't been willing to educate and train those who are natural born American citizens. At that point, Nixon was already to sign off on affirmative action. That's how I got it started. That and national security. I was able to convince Nixon that quality human capital is a national security issue and has very little or nothing to do with social justice. He understood that. And that's an easy case to make. Yeah. And when he bought into that one, I knew I was up and running. Now, nothing has changed. Let me, let me, let me come right on up to the moment. Nothing has changed. In fact, if ever it was human capital was ever a national security issue, it is a national security issue in post 9-11. We have lost the option. If we're going to have a workforce that's capable of holding its own with any other competitive country, much of that workforce is going to have to be homegrown. We cannot just go gilly galling around the world and recruiting people because they have a skill and think they love America. If there's anything we know now, as a nation as a whole, if there's anything we know, we know for certain that we are not the most loved country in the world. We know that. Which means then that the coming Michigan case is coming at the right time because it's clear now, it's clear now, with 67 major Fortune 500 companies filing amicus curie briefs in support of affirmative action. When I issued affirmative action 33 years ago, come this June, not a one of those companies filed an amicus curie brief supporting it, not one. When I issued that order 33 years ago, the AFL-CIO <laughs> fought it tooth and nail. Today, the AFL-CIO is filing an amicus curie brief in support of it. 14,000 law students are filing amicus curiae briefs in support of it. They know something that somebody else doesn't know, namely Fortune 500 companies now know that minorities and women make a major, major contribution not only to that company's bottom line, but makes it possible for them to compete in the most competitive global market that humankind has ever seen. Winning that battle, winning that battle, there can be no doubt about it. We must, Washburn and other schools must now produce a workforce that can keep America free, that can keep America secure, strong, keep it secure, keep it prosperous, and assured of a promising future. The kids we're teaching right now, that's their mission. I uh, was with the delegation to the UN for the 26th session. Now that was a critical one because prior to the 26th session, uh, the United States had been able to use its, its, um, its might and its power, particularly its pocketbook, to keep China out, keep Taiwan in, the Isle of Taiwan in, and China out of the UN. And China had put on a, a never-ending campaign for 25 years working every consulate in China, plus every consulate that they had a, 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 an ambassadorship in around the world, building up the boat. And each year during that 25-year period, they'd get closer and closer. Well, when the 26th session started, they knew they had the boat. And they got there in their mild jackets and everything. The day the convention, the day the conference opened, they were just sitting there waiting. And, and during that period, uh, there was a buildup uh, of speeches in the General Assembly session. There was a buildup of speeches all uh, full of animosity for the U.S. Uh, that, you, that you couldn't imagine was coming from every area. And um, the, um, um, uh, at that time, and I think it's still true today, the UN had three distinct blocks, uh, actually four uh, distinct blocks. One block was the non-aligned block. That's supposed to be small countries that weren't aligned with the communists or the socialists or, or the capitalists, the name of the uh, countries that practice democracy. But these three blocks, the non-aligned block, 
the communist bloc and the socialist bloc made up over over 60 percent of the votes uh, in the General Assembly, and uh, and their power was diminished over the National Security uh, over the, uh, the 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 Security Council, where they weren't on. So, but they were mad. Uh, they'd gotten angry over the years. So when the 26th session started, they knew they had the votes. China knew they were in. And all the animosity that they had, b had built up for America over that 26th were there was no one sh hiding it at that point. So each nation state had a chance to take the podium in the General Assembly and, and state its views before it cast its vote. Uh, to let China in. So from the day the curtain went up in September all the way to the date of that vote, all we heard was a tirade of, uh, of charges against the United States by one uh, or more of people from these three blocks that I just mentioned. That's the one they sent me to. <laughs> so uh, Nixon decided that uh, I had uh, affirmative action that caused him enough pain and they were looking for a way to get me out of the administration uh, rather painlessly. And at the same time, out of the, the domestic media market. They didn't want the domestic media market, anybody in the media market followed me at all. Well, one way to make sure that didn't happen was to send me to the United Nations as, as, as a delegate. Um, the media there is on the, on the, at, on the uh, ambassador only. And so the ambassador at the time I went was George Bush Sr. And um, when I got there, he assigned me to three committees, uh, one dealing with economic development in uh, underdeveloped and developing countries, two, the uh, environment, with special focus on, uh, on the ocean, uh, and three, the committee to end uh, all forms of, of, of discrimination. Uh, <laughs> what was interesting about the last one, all, ending all forms of discrimination, the members of the three blocks I told you about a moment ago had done their research uh, on me and the programs I supported. So they knew uh, all about the problem that I presented for the administration over affirmative action. And they pretty well knew that, you know, I, I really uh, um, took the country to the, to the woodshed, so to speak, over, uh, over uh, the need for affirmative action. Anyway, they had a policy there in terms of the U.S., and the policy was we don't control, we didn't control the machinery then, we don't control it now. So we, we just could present somebody to speak, but the people who controlled the different committees decide, decided the order in which you spoke. So if you were an American delegate, they would assign you in a way, in my case, I'll be specific, in my case, they assigned me so on the third committee dealing with uh, racism and, and, and eliminating racism from the global scene, they assigned me so I'd always be speaking behind four or anywhere from five to seven people who are anti-American. And those people would always pose questions for me to answer when it was my turn to speak. And I'll give you an example. While I'm there, Attica was going on, the riot at Attica. So while I'm there, they, they had all the data regarding the imbalance of blacks in prisons and the imbalance in law enforcement uh, in, 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 in black neighborhoods. So the speakers would get up and one would take certain, for example, the first one got up and, and took uh, birth rate, the, the birth rate of blacks, maternity, uh, uh, of blacks in Harlem uh, against, uh, against the child maternity rate in, <laughs> in Nigeria and say a black baby has no better chance of surviving in Harlem than one has of surviving in Nigeria or, or some uh, country in India. And I'm sure that when the distinguished delegate from America takes the poll, he's going to explain these differences. <laughs> well, then Attica was on it, so okay, I got up in front and talked about Attica and the ambassador. I'm sure that when the American delegate speaks, he's going to explain why there's a riot at Attica. <laughs> And he just ran it down, okay? So when it's my turn to speak, I, I knew this was going to happen. So instead of doing that, I had prepared a speech. First, the research staff at the, at the American mission had prepared a speech for me uh, to deliver on Monday, and they gave it to me on Friday. 
at about noon, and I read it throughout the afternoon and read pencil it up and carried it back and said, I can't give this. This, this, this is an apologist manifesto. I'm, I'm not going to apologize for being an American citizen, and I'm sure not going to apologize for representing the nation at this. So you, you got to bring me something different. They said, it's Friday. We don't have time to write you another one. Uh, that's it. And I said, well, I'm not giving this. So we arm wrestled a little while. Finally, I decided I'll write my own. And so uh, I did that over the weekend and uh, wrote one and gave it to him uh, just before time for me to deliver it, about a half hour, 15 minutes before time for me to deliver it. I gave him a copy of it. And since they didn't know what I was going to say, they didn't have an escort team to join me in the American box. Uh, the only person, they made a poor little intern that joined me, and he and I were the only ones that went into that box. Well, my speech, uh, it was based on how to use laws. First, you, ch you correct, the, in America, you correct the problem, number one, by getting laws on the books to make it illegal to discriminate because of race and gender. And then once you do that, then you, you staff, you provide the staff, you provide the money, and you do all the things necessary to make the legislation work. And uh, after you've done that, you then um, began the enforcement process. So at that point, I laid out what had happened. All those civil rights laws have only been on the books since 64. Uh, I laid out what had happened in a short period of time, what, what was getting underway and rolling in a short period of time between 64, when I was there, uh, when, I w when we didn't have the laws on the books, and uh, 70, uh, 71, while I was there uh, speaking. So I laid out... If this is a trend now, and the laws have only been on the books this short period of time, this is what's likely going to happen when 2000 rolls around. So I made, I made, I made predictions as to what would happen in housing rights, voting rights, housing rights, employment rights, uh, education rights, and public accommodation rights. And I laid out what both parties did regardless to which party was in control of the White House, here's what both parties did during since that legislation has been on the books. And if the trend continues, this is what it looked like when 2000, when the year 2000 ro rolls around. Well, this infuriated him. For, for, for me to dare to be able to say that America can manage this problem first by putting the laws on the books and making it happen. And what was interesting, and as they heard me, uh, Bush could sit over in his office, and believe it or not, the president could hear me uh, in his office in the White House. Well, by the time I got well into the speech, they'd skimmed it right quick across the street and read it and saw that it was a plus. So a phone call was made to the president and told him, listen to this. So he sat there in the old room <clears throat> and heard it too. So Bush heard it across the street. President heard it in the old room. I was interesting about this while I'm delivering this speech. Kissinger's in <laughs> Kissinger's in China. <laughs> Kissinger's in China getting ready for president to come over there. But anyway, the uh, the speech uh, had the had had a real positive impact, and uh, uh, no one but no one had any idea that I could do this. When it was over, I ended the speech by by saying to. Um, by saying to South Africa that based on the growth that is occurring right now, and I'm talking about 1970, based on the growth that's occurring right now, we have 14 blacks in the House of Representatives and one in the Senate, and based on the progress that's being made right now, unless you move quick, fast, and in a hurry, South Africa, and I look right at him, unless you move quick, fast, and in a hurry, uh, there'll be enough blacks in the House of Representatives to prevent America from doing business with South Africa. Well, of course, as you well know, it happened. Bill Gray got a piece of legislation to throw to do just that. And then just to wrap it up real good, I, I, I turned to the Russian delegate, since I had him sitting on the edge of the chair. I thought I'd give him a, a, a good reason to stay there a little longer. So I turned to him and I said, when this organization came into existence some uh, 25 years ago, um, blacks around 400 African Americans got visas to visit abroad. As I talk to you now, the record shows that 40,000 will go abroad to visit. And when the visit is over, 40,000 will come home. How many Jews will leave Russia and come home? 
when I did that, <laughs> had opened the floodgate, brother. And for the rest of that delegate of that session, I was a marked man. Wherever I went, whatever I said.